Yep, okay. we're going. All right, so welcome to our Bridge, uh, Bridge Street Lambrin Park planning um, meeting. I'm Anne Marie Mojo from the Recreation Department. I just want to let everybody know that this is being recorded. Um, this is Carlos from Berkshire Design. So he is going to tell us a little bit about the Lambrin Park design, what's there, and some of the ideas that have gone back and forth and that we've gotten from the public already, and then obviously your guys' input for what kind of things you'd like to see there. Yeah. Go ahead, Carlos. Yeah, uh, well, good evening. Um, so we are looking at the space on Lampron Park, which is adjacent to Bridge Street School. Um, and kind of the goal that I was given to was to create a space um, that had at least two um, playground features. Um, we were looking at a fence or some type of protection from Bridge Street. That was kind of the main concerns that I heard. Um, and also providing connection between this playground that we have now and, and the actual playground that we have, the new playgrounds that we have in Bridge Street School. So um, what I've, what you're seeing here in the, in the concept and this um, shape that you're seeing here is where the area that we, we will be installing playground equipment um, from the conversations that I had with Anne Marie and conversations that she had with the people uh, who are um, invested on the project. Um, they mentioned that we're, they were interested in swings, and so that was a, an element that we wanted to introduce um, in, in, the, in the park. And one of the things about swings is that they do take a large expanse of area because they have a larger safety zone or an area that you have to provide empty space so that there's no accidents and that type of thing. So that's why you're seeing that this area here is a larger area, and of course we chose you know, the park almost is divided in two by this sidewalk that goes right in the middle. And we have a lot of elements kind of happening in this area. There are a couple of monuments and plaques and um, that sort of thing. But um, even though we do have an area of open space up here, we wanted to keep um, as much as possible that playground equipment close to the school. And so it would be manageable by the teachers and everybody else who works there. Um, the other things that I thought about while I was looking at this was looking at the equipment that is actually right now installed here and knowing that there's been new climbing equipment um, and other features that are more in the climbing <laughs> part of, uh, of the play, playground equipment. Um, so my interest was to bring in something that was what in the playground industry is called a spinner or something that spins around. Um, a lot of those, they can be for one person or for multiple uh, uh, children. I chose something that was more for multiple children because I think that's more bang for your buck. Basically, you get more play uh, out of it and more kids that can play at once within one of the uh, uh, playground features. So I've, I've shown here an area, so that's a smaller play equipment that you're seeing here, more compact. And I'm giving three examples of, of types of, of um, spinners that I would like to see or I think are very, um, are very neat, first of all, and kind of new design, so they're not your typical type of playground equipment. And in addition to that, they're big enough that, as you can see, you can start having um, a cooperative play between the kids, so kids can be inside, and all the kids can be pushing them around, and you can get almost eight to nine kids in one of these, where in some of the other smaller ones, you can get maybe two or three kids in, in one of them. So that was my, my idea, and again, this is, Still conceptual and, 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 and to be discussed uh, with the people here. But so that's one of the ideas that we have on one side. The other side, the swing side that we were, I was looking at, was again like I mentioned before, uh, swings that are a little bit bigger than your typical swing. And this is the new trend again in um, in swings for playground equipment. It's uh, bigger. It looks like a saucer, a big saucer that you can get actually two or three kids within one. Um, and so it, again, establishes that cooperative play between kids. You can have more than one. They can be pulling to each, you know, each other. Um, and you can get, instead of having what you, we used to have, which is a um, maybe three swings, you could have three uh, children playing. Now we have three swings that you could get almost nine kids playing in the same swing. So um, these swings also, the way that they are um, um, tied to their frame, uh, they're, they're tied wider than the traditional swing. So what happens is the swinging happens mostly forwards and backwards. You don't have, you don't have that 
swinging to the sides as sometimes you get with the kind of older style um, types of swings. Also, they're not as high as those, like the ones that I grew up with, were, which were like 10 feet high, that you could jump and you were like flying in the air and, you know, um, uh, you know uh, having injuries from that. Uh, these are actually much kind of lower to the ground um, and, and less uh, of, a, of a, a problem uh, as some of those larger swings are. So another lot, you know, I think um, that's uh, the basic play equipment or play areas that we looked at. Uh, we do include two benches, one for each kind of one looking at each side so that the parents or the teachers can sit down while the kids are there playing. Um, these are wide benches, they're nine feet wide, so you can, it's a big, big bench. Um, we, I prefer having bigger benches than smaller benches so people have enough space to feel comfortable. Um, and then the other element or main element that we wanted to include in this park was a strong boundary uh, on Bridge Street uh, being such a, a busy street and having so much traffic. Um, we didn't want to just leave it as, well, it's very separated from the playground. No, we, I, we always thought that we needed something that was strong and that would prevent either kids or, or, or balls or frisbees trying, you know, going into the street and, um, and children going after them. So that would stop definitely, uh, we're suggesting a four foot high ornamental uh, fence uh, made out of you know, either aluminum or steel, uh, uh, something of that sort. No real, um, uh, there wouldn't be a gate itself to close in the park. It would be an opening for the sidewalk because I don't think we wanted to enclose this park to totally because it's actually also a part of the greater Northampton you know, uh, people, so they, the neighborhoods could use it um, in other ways. And then the third thing that I, from again, from the conversations I had with Anne Marie was that there was a need for leaving a large amount of open space so that children could have time and a place to just play with a ball and kick a ball. So we've moved most of the play equipment to closer to the school and left as much of that um, open space as possible. Um, the other um, thing that we wanted, I wanted to emphasize was that we're, tr we're trying to work with um, the trees that are in sight. They, there's really nice mature trees there, so the design that we're showing right now doesn't take out any trees. We're just working with the open area that we already have there. Um, and I mean, some of the equipment that I have right now here, um, it would be considered a five to 12 year old type of equipment. Um, some of these spinners, for instance, the, the ones that with the big platforms, they could, you could have children that are smaller. But for the most part, the equipment that I'm showing right now here are five to, what we call a five to 12 year old. So play equipment, just to give you the information, the play equipment gets divided between two to five year olds and then five to 12 year olds. Anything under 12, two years old, normally it's not, it's, it's just for, you know, preschools or, or that type of environment, or not even preschools, it would be more for uh, uh, daycare centers. Um, we will be providing a safety surface. Um, for any playground equipment, you have to provide a certain amount of, of safety surface that will be resilient to any fall so that uh, you prevent or minimize the injuries from accidents that could happen in the playground. And that safety surface also would include drainage underneath to keep that um, safety surface um, um, lasting for a long time. Normally, if you don't provide any type of drainage, what happens is that with water and freezing and thawing, you start to get very, a lot of compaction. So it's, in all our designs, when we do um, safety surface, we provide also drainage underneath um, for it. And in this case, what we are proposing is a wood carpet or wood chip type of safety surface. Um, again, all this that we're looking at as part of the design was also taken into consideration the budget that we have, which is even though it's 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 a good amount of money, but for play equipment, um, it's it's not that much. <laughs> um, some uh, people sometimes don't realize that play equipment is pretty expensive, um, and for two main reasons. One of them because they get really 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 used, um, and we need like a 20-year lifespan for these or 15. Lifespan. So for something that's going to be used literally every single day of the year, especially next to a school, it has to be very heavy duty, uh, very um, uh, strong. Um, so that's why the cost of these types of equipment tend to be between, um, I would say between 10,000 and up um, for, for the equipment you're 
you've seen here. Um, and I think that's my description of the park. And if I would love to have some input. <laughs> yes. Um, we have a, a couple of, well, so I'm speaking sort of on behalf of the preschool right yes. now. Um, we have children who are handicapped, physically handicapped. Mm -hmm. We would be interested in having swings that would be acceptable. So the swings that we're showing now here with, it depends on the level of, of handicap that yeah. the, the, the yeah. children have. Uh, like, uh, these actually are handicap accessible in the sense that they're wide and big enough that, and basically you could have a child and you could also have the adult helping them. We're in what we used to call a belt swing, which is a small seat. Right. It's very unstable and, and, and you, can, um, you can have issues with that. If, if you're looking at children with major disabilities, then I would definitely lean towards another type of swing, kind of more of the traditional swing and then using um, a seat that's appropriate for that, which has a full back, right. also has a neck uh, restraint and has sides. Um, and those are much more, you know, much safer for somebody who has a lot of disability. Right. Um, but these are kind of in the, the in-between. Um, I think you, you could say that, um, you know, compared to the old style swing, it's much more accessible, but you could definitely get something that has much more protection for somebody who has a lot of disabilities. Um, and, and again, this is all open to change, and I've shown some other examples where here we have a four bay swing, which one of these swings could be one of those seats, and it's not, a, you know, it will be an easy, basically an easy swap that you could have there. Um, and same thing with any of these elements, they have a large, you know, especially like this one has a large uh, flat platform on the bottom so that you can, again, you could have a transfer. It's low to the ground enough, and so it's lower than 36 inches, so there is the ability of transferring into the, into the equipment. It's not a, what we would call a um, you know, restrictions-free type of environment. Those would be very specialized and it would be you know, towards uh, more geared towards people who have majors in disabilities. One of the other things that um, we've been talking about is, um, and I can't think of the name of it right now, but you could think of it, those big blue blocks that we've been looking at. Um, structure. Where you yeah, the they're children can move. yeah. They're just these really huge, um, okay. light, very lightweight. I, and I, I've seen them where you can basically it's like there's a building like a couple, block, but it's a yeah, big, big, big. There's a couple of playgrounds in, in New York City that mm -hmm. I've seen on, online that have them. Um, they're very, you know, free play, open play, mm -hmm. um, multi-use kinds of things. They're very lightweight. Um, they need to get put away. You know, they, they wouldn't be able to be left out at night. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, and I, I think it will be something that I would love to look into and yeah. see what budget-wise and yeah. what the requirements will be for, for instance, for the, you know, would we need safety service for those? Probably not. So if, yeah. if that's the way that, you know, most people are leaning to, we could maybe save some money there and do something else. What is the, what is the timeline for this project? Well, we, <laughs> funds, uh, I would leave it, I, uh, Anne Marie knows much more than I do, but I believe that we have to spend the money by December. Right, right. Yeah. Yep. So that's also one of the things that we're looking at that we are looking right. at equipment that we could pull out of a catalog or from a distributor um, and we wouldn't have a huge amount of lead time or a major design, for instance. It, it would be nice if we have more time um, and more budget <laughs> and we could design something that's more free form or something yeah. that will be a more, more of a, a natural type of, uh, of play, playground. Two things that happens with those is that, first of all, you have a huge amount of upfront costs for those because of the design. Um, and the other thing is liability. So the person who's designing these has to kind of take over the liability on them. Where these types of equipment, um, you're buying it from somebody who's already done the testing, and, and there the liability kind of goes to the playground. What's, what's the timeline for getting information into you um, for comments? Okay. Well, just for like design ideas. I yeah. Guess. I mean, hopefully by next week. After like, thinking about it over okay. the weekend, chat about it. Yeah. Yeah. The, lead, yeah. the lead time for, for these sorts of equipment is between six weeks and ten weeks. 
So that's why there is this need to, and then you have a deadline of December. Yes, yeah. So I mean, an installation could be can be done fairly. You know, you could keep going and installing it. Um, any type of damage that will be done to any of the outside while they're doing this, then seating and that sort of thing would have to then, you know, it would be logistics of trying to deal with that because we have a window of to, depending on how cold it is, but November, mid-November would be the, the last seating I would do. If it's warm, if it's cold, then you wouldn't get any seed uh, popping until the next of the year. We're not proposing doing a lot of sod, you know, a lot of turf here, but any damage that happens while the work is being done would be uh, low and seated. Uh, have, uh, yep. the, the spinners, I, I understand your concept of uh, more angry about more students, more kids are moving on and around it. I'm not quite sure the, the exact feasibility for our particular school. Okay. When you see the sidewalk that divides the school yep. and the park, mm -hmm. um, actually if you go over more. Oh, this one? Yes. Yep. Um, during school hours, oftentimes for supervision, we, that's where our zone stops during school hours. I see. The, the amount of time that that would get used would be a couple hours after school, maybe. Okay. Okay. So, uh, but during school or um, maybe some other times, a lot of kids tend to play on playground structures that are already at the school. And um, so, you have mentioned uh, the, 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 the age group for a lot of this equipment is five through 12, and perhaps yeah. something that is more lenient towards the two and five year olds. Yeah, for sure. Um, this yeah. way the preschool children who, they actually use the, the playground structure that's already there. Mm -hmm. Initially that structure was built for the older students, right? So yeah. if, if you can gear it towards yeah. uh, the spinner. The I swings think I think will work wonderful. But. And uh, so let me grab something. And this is for my next presentation, but I, I just wanted to pull it out there. So these are the types of, you know, these are one of the manufacturers, but right. these are some of the equipments that you would be looking at a two to five year old right. um, scale. And you could still have, for instance, some of, you know, you have something like this where, um, again, you can have more, more than one uh, child right. playing with it. You have like these three sided uh, type of structure. Yeah. It has ladders, it has holes, it has things to do. So. I would uh, love after we finish here if you wanted to look at some of these and if you wanted to just you know say well that looks and I have like three or four different manufacturers in there so you can okay. look at kind of the sort of things that they are. This in particular I like because their design is kind of a little bit more artful. You know mm -hmm. it's not this your typical you know plastic uh, looking uh, yeah. playground equipment. Um, and for instance, you also have opportunities for more imaginative play, mm -hmm. where you have like this is kind of like a boat. Um, but so the kids, it's not just about moving around and spinning around. It's also about having, you know, being able to say, you know, uh, the child could, uh, the children could be playing as uh, if they were in a boat, if they were pirates or, or, or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. And then we have something like this, where then there is that cooperative play, where you have this is. The equivalent of what we would have, you know, one of these uh, uh, a seesaw or something like that. But what it, it ends up happening has actually three seats, has springs in the middle, so mm -hmm. the movement of one kid affects the other. So they start yeah. to actually interact with each other. That's great. So those are the types of equipment that I would, you know, lean towards if we were looking to the two to five. Yeah. Well, I would just back up that point that um, in, you know, uh, there's the preschool there, but also this is meant to be a community playground, and there aren't a lot of So, total? Uh, 125,000 total. But that includes Correct. design, yeah. it includes, um, if I'm not mistaken, there is some electrical work that yeah. has to go on in the yeah. park. So that, um, you know, when I was looking at this, I was taking basically those two and the fencing first and then the safety surface <laughs> and then whatever's left over kind of we have for the play equipment because okay. all the other things we kind of need. We cannot have the play equipment. We don't have the fencing or the safety surface or the electric work that has to go through the park. So that's why we've limited to just two pieces of equipment. That said, I think we have enough budget 
to have definitely maybe even two of these smaller two to five year old and then a nice swing, especially if we're not looking at the larger swing with a big C, we're looking at a more regular swing with one of the uh, accessible uh, seats yeah, that would bring the cost down. Maybe add, uh, you're going to do swing and you might as well do many bays and things like that. Yes. Or yeah. And do some bucket swing. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that would, basically what we were looking, I was, you know, the most you can get probably for one single system of swings is about four. So I was looking between three and four seats. Um, the first one that I was looking at was a three-seater, but each one of the seats are uh, big saucers that you can actually, two kids or three kids could be in one of them. Um, but if we went with regular swings, I would be looking at a four bay, you know, having four seats in, 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 the, in the swings. Um, we could even maybe extend it. Yeah, thank you. We could even have two pairs of three ones, so we got six. Um, one thing that I have to Though I have to say is that the safety surface, so it's a, every time you put more equipment, you have more safety surface and it swallows a large amount of money. Um, we're looking at, you know, for wood chip, we're looking between six and eight dollars a square foot um, for that type of material. So when you start, for instance, with what we have here right now was um, just as a quick estimate that I was getting to. We're looking about 2,600 to 2,700 square feet, and that's about $16,000 worth of, of safety equipment. So, safety surface. So, if we, for instance, if we were to expand this and put another set of swings here, we are almost doubling that number. Again, and going back to, I think, having the now with the comments that we've had here, moving away from the more expensive swing and going to one that I can get more base out of that could balance it out and maybe we could have a little bit more of the safety uh, surface. Well. I'd love to take the idea of that being of the big saucer swing back to the preschool teachers and see what, you know, what they thought about that age. Um, one other thing is that you can have a combination, even still with your normal swings, like one of the things that I really like design-wise about these is that it's a very nice, beautiful arch. Um, it's not your, you know, your yeah. typical rig that looks like an A-frame um, and, and tubing. Um, so, but again, you can get that bigger. Like here, we have an example of two bay, you know, uh, well, two bays with two uh, belt swings and one of those, and we could have maybe another one right next to it, because the difference in price, these with the arch are probably three times as more, more expensive than your, your normal, typical swing. So we could probably balance it out by having more swings, being able to have probably one accessible, one, one saucer, and maybe three or four of the normal belts, and we could have a, you know, huge, a long bank of, of swings. What would be underneath the wood chips? So normally you have, depending on, so the depth of the wood chips depends on the height of the play equipment. So the higher the play equipment, the thicker that layer is. Uh, usually you would have 12 inches of wood chip, and then underneath that you have between four and six inches of, of uh, stone that helps with drainage. And then you would have drainage pipe going inside of that. And then kind of sandwiched, uh, uh, being the bread of the sandwich uh, for the, the stone is uh, a, a, a geotextile, a fabric, so that you don't get kind of uh, dirt going through the rock so that it stays there and stays clean for a long time so that it still drains. So, yeah, when you're looking at safety surface then, you know, it, it's, it's the surface where we're looking at a profile of about 18 to 20 inches of, that you're digging down. Um, especially if you've seen it well, because you yeah. saw how the, all the play equipment went in on Bridge Street, which doesn't seem like, when you look at a playground, you don't think it's going to be that much work, but it is a lot of kind of earthwork that has to happen. Yes. You mentioned electrical work. What kind of electrical stuff are you talking about? You're talking about putting lights up that are going to shine? As um, part of the state grant, when you receive the state funds, you have to put any overhead wires underground. So we have to take all the overhead wires and um, put them under. So you're not talking about putting lights on there. They're going to um, Not on the plate. Not out there. We want to replace, um, put a couple lights along the walkway that are kind of right now, there's these big telephone poles with uh, street lamps on them. So we'll be replacing those because we'd take all those and put them underground. Well, so it would be putting a um, 
we've, we've met with the city electrician and things to figure out where that could go near Bridge Street, come off, come off existing um, pole there. Can't remember what the unit would be called. That would be put in, and then there'd be a few lights out there, depending on where um, when we met with um, the principal and things when we, when we were out there, where it needs to be lit. I, I, I live across the street. I don't want yeah. to be shining. Oh, no, no, no. These are um, okay. kind of like decorative, more decorative. Well, we call it pedestrian lighting. So yeah. it wouldn't be yeah. you know, like cobra heads that you see in a parking lot that are no. you know, 15, 20 okay. feet high. This is uh, kind of a, the scale. Exactly. Yeah. And they and because of city regulations, they have to be uh, uh, no uh, excess light. Um, so no spillover of the light can right. get out of right. the park in itself. Um, and the other thing is it will be, um, you know, no, they don't create light pollution, so they, they're what we call a, a zero dark sky, so that you don't get any light going up, so the light is really facing down. And it's also more, I mean, parks aren't really open. It, it's not something that you encourage use to after dark anyway, in the, on the play equipment and things, so it's a lot of it is for when there's you know, school events, different, you know, neighborhood walking to meetings at Bridge Street School in the winter and things like that, so. So it'll be near the walkways. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Fred Zimnock. I live near uh, Lampern Park, and uh, one of the uh, things in Lampern Park that uh, I, I uh, notice is the uh, special uh, Liberty Elm Tree. Yes. Uh, which is also our 911 memorial. Where is that on the picture? So we're still it's still right here, and we've basically we've kept the whole playground area outside of the memorial, the flagpoles, and the rest of the, but there's a plaque too in, in the park. So. so it's right next to the playground? It's, it, yes. I mean, it's probably about five feet to ten feet away from the playground. Um, to, to the play equipment. Yes. Um, and we would be looking at the swing area, would be the area um, that would be um, closest by. So none of the special service that you're making is going to impact the... No. Uh, no, no, whatsoever. We basically what I tried to do is try to not impact the trees as much as possible. So I kept everything outside of what we call the drip line of those trees, so that whatever roots are ex existing right now there, they wouldn't be impacted or, or minimize the impact on those. And then once it's established, the trees that are growing, they can grow their roots basically underneath all the you know the safety of the surface, so it wouldn't be an impact. Uh, the storm, or the uh, drainage you're going into the stormwater system, or so that's uh, that's something that we are still, I will, we're still thinking of if the soils are good enough there that we can just have the stone underneath and let that so that would accumulate a certain amount of water when yeah. it rains and then it would just percolate right there. If that's not the case, that the soils are are good for that, then. We would then hook up either with one of the, uh, um, the catch basins for the, in the city, or that's the way we would have to do it. There's there's not a lot of places you could daylight water here that would go somewhere that you could use it. Um, and again, we because the safety surface is about 12 inches, and then you have another six inches. It, it it's pretty deep, so it's yeah. hard to actually daylight it. Especially if this whole area is totally flat. Um, so yeah, most probably it will go to the municipal. Uh, storm drain. Um, that said, the same amount of water that goes to those structures, you know, the water that will go here and will go into any of these structures um, will be the same amount of water that you would get if you didn't have them because it's the same type of runoff and it's pretty permeable. That thing will be very permeable. Is only along Bridge Street. Only along Bridge Street, we've kind of bent it at both ends to even give a little bit more protection. Um, but yes, and and there's a cost you know element to that. So it would have been nice to you know I would have preferred if I could have pulled more fencing there. But the reality is that it's very expensive stuff. So we wanted to have it where it really you know we really needed it. And and I was mentioning before the new trends in playgrounds is trying to protect children that could have some disability that could feel very overwhelmed in a situation and what happens is that kids run away from where there's a lot of noise. So we're trying to, you know, in addition to protecting for balls and all that stuff, but also we're protecting uh, kids from, you know, running into the street here. 
So that, that was, you know, the two functions. Do you, um, do you think about uh, fishes or shrubs at all? So the and truth is no. Ongoing cost yes, and and that's the type of thing that I can see how in the future it, you know, we're the, this is the the big investment, and then I think those are the things that you could get by doing um, community, um, you know, raising money through the community or raising money through the PTO, or going to a nursery and you know talking to them and seeing if they could uh, give away some trees or stuff. Um, it's my experience, I'm, I'm you know, a little extra information. I'm, I'm, I have a 12 year old and I've been part of the school committee in Sunderland where I live. And we're in the process of also doing uh, playgrounds. And one of the things that we all find out is that it's really hard to get money for infrastructure. It's really hard to get money for play surface. It's really hard to get. So once you get it, you use it as much as possible. It's much easier later on to get a tree or get plaques or get benches because people are much more, more willing to give money for that type of thing. Thing. They don't like giving money for rock. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you expect for annual maintenance cost? So, for the play equipment itself, and and it's it's really minor. Um, this the play equipment itself is hardy enough that you shouldn't be looking at any chipping or any of that for the first five or six years. There could be, and I, I want to put the say that in normal use. I mean. I've seen playgrounds that have been um, graffitied and things like that, which are kind of out of the um, extraordinary. I wouldn't see that in my head. I feel, as a, as a designer, you have what we call a lot of eyes in this playground. There's a lot of traffic going through here. There's a lot of neighbors that are here. It's totally flat, so you have a clear view. So, so in that sense, I don't think there's going to be as much, or there's not going to be a lot of you know, um, bad use or, or, or use that will be detrimental to the equipment. Um, I would say you will get, you will need around probably 300 to 400 dollars a year for extra wood chip that you would have to keep kind of putting back in here, um, and that's one of the downsides of the wood chip material. The upside is that it costs probably one fifth the cost of rubber material or other types of material that lasts a long time. But that's the area. Um, that's around you know 300 500 dollars I would say a year for extra wood chip and any cleaning of the equipment. Um, you normally get a, a kit of um, touch of paint and that type sort of thing. So those are the things that you see in the play equipment. And the lifespan is between 15 years. If it's really well kept, it's 20 years. Um, it's, if it's really uh, on and you don't have good drainage. Well, I've seen playgrounds that fail in 10 years, but for the most part, from from what I'm seeing here, from what I've been talking to you guys, and the use that it seems to be getting, I would say you could get 15 years out of the play equipment for sure. And I think, I mean the. The comments about the two to five year olds was was really good because I was looking at the five to twelve year old yeah. because normally that's the larger population when when you have the school and I know you had new equipment there but I thought that that was the impact but it's really good to get the feedback that it's two to five because I can go back to the drawing board and make it more towards that age group instead of doing the five. To yeah, and I guess realistically, even though we are you know really appreciative of the fence as a barrier to the road. I think what Craig is saying is probably real, at least for now, is that you know the the daytime use of the playground is really going to be on this side of mm -hmm. the walkway, just in terms of when, you know doing school time. Adults are out there watching the kids, mm -hmm. um, and um, you know that that may change. I don't know, but I think for now we, we kind of say that what's on the park is going to be used primarily after school. Okay. I mean, I think also the fence has this kind of double effect to it, to the fact that actually it also creates this boundary that I would say, like when I, my first experience on that front was that I saw it and I didn't see any connection between the school and the park. Right. But once you have a harder edge on that side and you kind of bring it in, exactly, it starts to be more part, it almost feels like it's going to be more part of the, uh, the school. One of the things, I mean, and, and again, this are, these are tr new trends in, in, in 
playground is that, for instance, children that are autistic or children who have some type of spectrum um, in autism um, get very, very um, over stimulated at uh, some points. And even with adult supervision, they tend to just run. Um, that's one of the things that I've, you know, we've had, there's research that has come out um, that that's why this trend of having fencing when you have really high traffic areas, even if it is watched, it would be, you know, you cannot watch every single kid every second. So it's one of those things that I think we are looking more and more to integrate into parks where you have, you know, high traffic areas, even if it's far away or even if you have um, ice on the kids. There could be some child that could, you know, could run away uh, in a situation. So, again, the, that's the way we look at the at a new playgrounds in a way. Um, yeah. We're getting to this already. What, what is the height of the fence? Press is four feet high. Four feet high? Okay. Yeah, I guess the delicate balance just like you want to encourage children who aren't at the school to use the park, but also want the fence to protect the children, but also not shut out the. Yeah. And, and again, that's why we didn't include a gate. Um, there is an opening on the sidewalk, but it's an open, you know, it's, it's open to the public if they want to go through. So only where the sidewalks are, those are the access. Yeah, there's a, those well, right here, yeah, the second sidewalk will be here because the fence kind of stops right there, and then on this side is just the street, so it kind of wraps around. But yeah, the two sidewalks will be open to the public as a community playground would be. And, and that's a question I would have. It's, is the playground in the school open after school hours? Yeah, I mean, it's public property. It's a public park. Yeah. yeah. No, the playground. No, the, the school park. Oh, the school, the school park. But the Lampton Park is a public park. No, but he was saying, is the playground in the school open yeah. after school hours? And, and, and thinking of then, you would get then use, if you have, if you um, allow people to use the, the playground in the school, then you'll you'll definitely have kids going in here and after school hours and using it. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. I mean, I think I would definitely take into consideration. I, I think that distance-wise, we have enough distance that you could have. I mean, yeah, you, I mean, you could have a gate. I, I feel like when I go to a park and I see a gate, immediately I feel, even if it's open, because it, will be, it would have to be closed, because if not, it wouldn't. It, it, you know, you have the sense of that I'm not kind of welcome here. So that's one, one of the reasons why we left it open. But, I understand your point. If you have a, you know, especially when you're looking at two to five year olds, um, we we've, we've kept the playground away from that opening. It's more than 60. It's about 80 feet, probably the closest. You know, the, this would be the closest element to that opening. So. On the walks, yeah, yeah. It's also that it's a crosswalk out of the school. Yeah. So it's sort of, I think, keeping that access open. Um, I mean, it's, it's a, I, I, I'm kind of simply saying you need to start to close the whole place for um, the comfort of parents. Right. But I mean, yeah. I feel like. I mean, if it was, if it was going towards that, the other road, and I don't know what it's called, I'm saying you don't need to be the gate, but yeah. Bridge Street. It's something that we, we could be open to it. I mean, I, I don't know. But I mean, who's going to close the gate? I mean, the parent who's there sees it open and just worries about their kids who like to run. So you'd rather have to away, the option to close yeah, it if you have a child. Yeah. That's, that's but then after you leave, you open it. No, the person who wants to walk in, I mean, it can have like a sign on it, welcome, or so that people know it's an opening, but it could be. I, Again, I, you, yeah. we could go either way. Yeah. It's, no, it's one of those things yeah. that, that we could go either way. One of the things, if, if we had a gate, we would have to make sure that it's 80. And so if it had a latch, because it's a public park, it would definitely be an ADA accessible. So it would have yeah. to have the reach for an ADA person. And also probably would have to have, yeah, at least the latch would have to be within the regulations of Americans with Disabilities Act. So it would be a little bit 
little bit more involved than your normal game. But again, it's something that we're open. You know, I think I'm, I'm open to it. You have and I, I mean, I just wanted to just to get some input. I think I'm clear that there is a need for swings, and that swings would be a great thing. Um, on the other side of things that, like of the equipment that I've shown, and I can actually, I have some other equipment here that, uh, these are two other companies um, that produce um, high quality equipment. This one's called Big Toys. And they tend to have more, you know, free form looking types of equipment in here. This is kind of a path that you can grab yourself and kind of walk and you can either go underneath or you can come on top. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're like basically, yeah, like a tunnel. Through it on top of it. One of the things I like about those is that they become an obstacle that you can go through, but it becomes the clubhouse, you know, once in a while you get kids, you know, sitting inside of them and just having a private time with yeah. themselves, which is one of the other things that you want to provide in a playground, just an area that's quiet and that kids can kind of go. Th these are recycled plastic. They're all, these are plastic. And then... Um, in terms of these are probably, I mean, they're a little bit more, this company itself is a little bit more expensive than the first ones that I showed you, but these types of equipment are not terribly expensive. Okay. Um, so so they will be equal. We didn't go with the spinning thing, which I do like, yeah. but I just wanted to take Well, the age group, it seems, yeah. if, if we're looking at two to five, the truth is that the, those spinners would definitely be five to 12 year olds. Yeah. I mean, you can have a... And you know, again, the new trends is to integrate a little bit more like yeah. little kids with the bigger kids. But yeah. the reality is that if you, you see those spinners, um, they do have a speed, um, they a speed <laughs> yeah. regulator yeah. inside yeah. of them because yeah. they ha they have a system inside that you cannot go too fast mm -hmm. on them. But still, you have climbing, and so you you could see how there could be a uh, you know conflict between kids that are really small and really yeah. And yeah. bigger. Yeah, um, yeah this um, we we're talking about probably half the price of what we we were looking at before. So. Whatever we save here, we could do more more swings. We could do the safe, the extra safety surface that we would need probably for the swings. Those two, like, would it be possible to go with those two in the middle, like one of each of those designs, that one and one above it, right? Space-wise, how much space? That's a cool, it's a good question. I would have to go double check what the requirement for ball zone. So what happens is you need safety surface up to what we call the safety zone or the soft ball zone. That zone is, it's dependent on the height. Mm -hmm. So these are seem to be pretty low. So if it's a nor your normal type of equipment that has eight foot fall zones, tend to be about six to eight feet away. You know, you have to have this area. For something like that might be smaller. So I would have to double check on right. if we can actually put two of them together. One of the other things, you cannot overlap these fall zones. So you, so they have to be, you know, um, they can't be overlapped. And, and the logic is that, um, you know, one child could fall on top of either another child that's playing on the other side, or it could be hitting one of the other, other you know, uh, pieces of equipment that's on the other side if you overlap them. So they want you to be totally separated. Um, but yeah, it, and I think, you know, this is a tight, kind of a tighter space. <laughs> yeah, it looks that way. Because we don't have a lot, you know, a, a lot of places to go at. So, you know, we could be looking at maybe moving a little bit further out. I did want to, you know, as just looking at this design, I wanted to have you know about 50 to 80 feet between any place in the road here. Right. And there's a large tree. Yeah, right on the corner. So right I, you know, tree, I think. we're almost tight here, and and I am from conversations that we had had before. I know that there was a need to keep as much open space in here in the park because it's, it's really used also for other things, not just for just play equipment. So. It is a tight park, but we can, you know, I can definitely go in and, and look at what, how things uh, fall um, with something like that. Um, so we have those equipments, and then, I mean, this is more of your typical playground, not looking at uh, bigger elements, but there are, you know, musical sets that you can get, um, which I don't necessarily, I think there, there's a place for them, but 
not necessarily close to the school or, you know, and here it's pretty far away, but it's, it would be something, uh, we were suggesting these for instance for Florence Fields, where you really have a huge amount of open space and if the kid wants to make a lot of noise, they can. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, we've actually been looking at, um, they're much more sort of homemade looking devices where you have just lots of objects that are, you know, hanging, yeah. um, that are all sorts of interactive ways of playing with them. Yep. and making noise out of them. And I think that's not a bad idea. Yep. Um, and I, I think that you know, the actual amount of use that the park gets during school hours is... So you could have noise. something that actually yeah. made some yeah, noise. Yeah, that, that, that would cause a problem. So. So what, what I will do, I will look into, and not necessarily, because I know that I, there's a company called Boric that's, that makes these very nice looking um, metal um, equipment that has, you know, they basically have a, a rubber mallet that you hit, you know, the different tubes. They're all also, they've been um, tuned yeah. so that yeah. you're not making a noise yeah. that actually is very yeah. uncomfortable for people yeah. to listen to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you got it. So those tend to be, even though they look pretty simple, they tend to be pretty expensive. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. but, <laughs> yes, or basically, <laughs> or, or, you know, maybe, again, we are, we're looking at equipment that might be a little bit less expensive than what we were looking at before. Right. So I would definitely, I mean, I'm open to looking yeah. into those. I mean, I think sort of the more free play, interactive, creative yep. play that can go on, I, I really like that idea. And, you know, we have enough that sort of determines how you use it by its shape and structure. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to sort of, you know, if we can, get away from that yep. so that, you know, it's, it's more just, you know, free form play. And to the truth, you know, something like this, for me, it's not the type of thing that I would put yeah. in a park because one of the cool things that I find about Lampron is that it's a small park that you're just putting two elements in there. So you really want them to be almost sculptural. You want them to be something that is actually also harmonious with the park itself so that it's not like you have a, a memorial and all of a sudden you have this really bright colored you know, thing right in front of it. Um, and, and when you're driving by, you're looking at this very peaceful park, and all of a sudden you have this really oh, bright and, and screaming in your face type of color. So the Borg, you know, when you mention that, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Those uh, are very beautiful, and it's in themselves just as, as pieces of equipment. Um, so I, I will definitely look into those and see, you know, what how it lands in the budget. Yeah, yeah. I just put a plug in for. separation, I think, um, where you could have something there that would make some, and, and these equipments are meant so that they don't make an excessive amount of harsh noise. They're all being, like, they're all tuned to a certain scale so that they don't actually don't make a, a sound that actually is very you know, deterring or it just doesn't, you know, people are going to be just not, not liking them. And they don't tend to be a very, a sound that actually projects a long way. They've designed them that way so that it basically within the park, um, especially if you have, and also, you know, you have a certain amount of noise canceling things going on, especially a road that's going through it, you know, having a road between the element and the rest of the neighborhood, the, the, no the road makes a certain amount of noise in itself, so it kind of baffles anything that happens in there. The other thing that we have to think about is this, uh, that I, again, I see the two sides of the coins all the time, that's kind of the part of the design but this would be only used during the daytime. So the times where people would get really bothered by it or you know, would be unpeaceful, people wouldn't be using them at five o'clock in the morning or they wouldn't be using this uh, you know, late in the evening or even after five when or six o'clock. the last time you were at Bridge Street Park? <laughs> <laughs> actually, there are yeah. people there 20,000 a day. Really? I've, I've been there quite a bit actually because we have a project across the street, but I've never been in uh, dark, <laughs> after dark there or you know, before nine o'clock in the morning. Be amazed what goes on in that park. <laughs> 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 
so yeah, I mean, I think I, I like the uh, the tunnel climb through low to the ground yep. idea. I'd love to see the swings, um, and you know, as sort of simple and structural. Mm -hmm. Actually, I mean, and even <laughs> the idea of the box, I, I'm really, I mean, I it's it's, yeah. it's really cool. One of the things that I think about it being, I would think that it would work really well if you were inside, more inside the school and this is not a part, because basically once you, it would have to have somebody to come in and every day yeah. it would have to take it yeah. away. Yeah. And then on the weekends it's basically, oh, it, no. it's yeah. not used. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but it, it is, you know, another idea that's really, really, you know, really cool for a playground where you can let the kids basically do, do their own playbook. <laughs> And, and again, I, I will, you know, all these ideas, I will work on them in the next couple of days, you know, between Friday and Monday. Um, so I will come up with some alternatives for you guys, and then I'll transmit those to Anne Marie so that she can, you know, make everybody aware of where we're, you know, what, what we could actually have there. And then, because we have this tight deadline, I, I'm going to try to uh, pass along alternatives to what we've shown today as quickly as possible by next week so that we can. Then look at final, finalizing the design. I have a page on the um, recreation department website, a page with the, with the meeting notice for tonight, and I'll put up any other designs that he sends or any other ideas so that people can see those in the next, within the next meal over the weekend or whatnot. And if you have comments, just email them to me at the rec department, and that's on the city website also. like to vote for more equipment instead of just one that costs a lot of money? Yeah. No, that's, I, you know what? Um, I, I get it. One of the things is that I, I feel like we've, you know, beyond the equipment, the area that I'm showing here is about the area that we're going to, you know, I don't think right. it's going to grow much more than what we have there right. because we have the, all this kind of constraints with the trees. We have the area that we want to keep open. Right. We have the monuments and, and all the things that are going on there. So we are definitely limited to a certain degree on what we have there um, on space. You know, I'm seeing an area, you know, of that size because anything beyond, you know, I, I wouldn't be putting anything on the other side of the trees, it seems to me. Yeah. It doesn't seem like the, the right space to do that. Um, but we'll see how much we can get in there. I was the just more space on the two and five-year-olds. You yeah. can just go along cost 10000 or you can get two yeah. or three other items instead. Yeah, uh, actually. Yes. Multiple kids jumping on and off and through objects. Then. And just to, you know, just to throw some numbers, like your typical, you know, these four bays probably are in the $3,000 range. Yes. It's, you know, three to $4,000 installed. Mm -hmm. Well, you're seeing these that are more artful, they get to the $20,000, $25,000 right. range. The same thing with these types of equipment. Mm -hmm. You know, you're looking at twenty to 25000 If we go with the tubes and another thing, we will probably be in the same Right. Um, even though those tubes look really simple, but um, I'm, I, I haven't, I don't have a cost right now for them, but I'm pretty sure they're not going to be really, really cheap. Um, they are very, these companies are, you know, again, the equipment has to last a certain amount of time. They do give warranties for all the equipment, and they're going to be uh, permanently installed, so you need a contractor to come in and put footings down and all that sort of thing. So that starts to balloon a little bit of the price right. range, any of this stuff. But we'll, I mean, I will definitely, uh, put my designer hat and, and try to get more things in there as much as I can. Yes? Uh, I would assume that at least half the cost of the fence, most of the cost of the fence. Well, the, the fence is, I, well, and this is from the, you mean, you want to know how much kind of the fence is? Yes, yeah, so it's left over for toys. And yeah, well, the fencing, I'm looking at around twenty to $24,000 worth oh, of fencing. Okay. It's it's not bad, but it's one fifth of the budget, or a little bit more. <laughs> so because after you take the electric, you take the designer fees, you know, at that point, twenty thousand bucks is about one quarter to a fifth of the total cost. So it's one of those things. And then safety surface is going to be almost the same. Um, we're looking at almost the same number. So that's why. Um, and and I, guess, I guess the way I again, like I said, I prioritize by doing. Fencing, play equipment, yeah, uh, fencing, safety, surface, and then whatever was left over, I started, then that was my budget for the actual yeah. play equipment. 
Um, and we had two benches and, you know, I added two benches in there, probably you're looking, you know, between 2,500 for two benches, 5,000 mm -hmm. bucks between the two benches. Right. So, they're huge benches. Yeah, yeah they're yeah. nine foot benches. I mean, it's the type of thing that you kind of need yeah. uh, when you have a playground, uh, especially now that we're also looking at a two to five year old where you need, you know, more attention. Yeah. Oh, I thought you were um, Yeah, where, where you really want to have parents uh, have a spot. Plus, it's, it's a place where the parents are going to socialize. Right. <laughs> You're going to meet the other parents there. There's a one, the whole park in itself, on, uh, some of the trees just need a little touch up on Because we're going to have this awesome structure here. And I know a lot of the tree limbs are very, very low. So it's not something that I understand you would be well, responsible with. That could be. City matter well, if we're, if we're putting the equipment there and we're going to be doing work around those, any, you know, the trees that are immediately close by, right. I don't think it would be not worthwhile including it in, the, in this project if right. you needed to limb trees because it wouldn't be a huge amount of cost for somebody who's already there doing the work okay. um, to pull somebody so to pull the resources from the city to do that it always it's always hard because they have a huge amount of trees that they have to deal with right. and then to pull a private uh, contractor or somebody to come in you okay. you couldn't do it because it's not enough money for somebody to actually yeah. come out and, and want to bid for something like that so it would be a moment you know if we're putting this out and those trees like one two three four trees that are right next to it they have issues with limbs yeah it's the time to do it when That's we do the part that if we do that you put it in swing to goes a certain height it goes a certain yeah and it's going to be in a way well yeah. from where the Liberty Tree is yep. uh, over to uh, so this doesn't in that yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. right. One of the reasons why is because of the tree limbs are that far away. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but we're literally, there's some large tree limbs that we try to stay away from from that area. We use it as shade breaks when it's the right, right for some, but yeah, it, it's a perfect uh, area. We took into consideration the distance for that. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, no, thank you guys. Uh, thank you for your input. I mean, that's Welcome to our Florence Recreation Field Playground meeting. Um, I'd like to introduce, my name is Anne Marie Mogio. I'm the Director of Recreation, and this is Carlos from Berkshire Design. Carlos is going to introduce the project and a little bit about it. Okay. So, uh, start off with um, we're looking at the area. Actually, let me grab it. Quickly grab this so we can orient, orient everybody. So this is the kind of the master plan for Florence Fields. This is an earlier rendering that we had done. Uh, but what we are, what I wanted uh, people to be clear is the area that we're looking for the playground. When we did the design for the fields, we left an area um, that we designated for a playground. And there's also an area for a concession building. Both of those, both of the playground and the concession building are the next projects that are going to be built in, in Florence Fields. We've finished uh, all the fields, the parking lots, and um, the two ball fields. So, um, so that people understand, we are basically to the north, um, to the north of uh, Meadow Street. Um, and that's the area that we're, I'm going to be talking about for the playground. And so now we come back. Originally, we had left a, a pretty large area for the playground, which ideally we could have done a very big playground here, but um, budget constraints and also the fact that maybe we didn't need as a large of an area for the playground. We've kind of concentrated most of the play equipment away from the street um, in the ex using the existing walkways, and that was part the beautiful thing about the master plan was that we designed all these walkways in harmony to whatever was going to happen here. So we have this nice kind of curve um, that um, uh, in the sidewalk that provides us a, a nice space for for our play equipment. Um, the so the main intent of the playground was to have two areas: a two to five year old and a five to twelve year old area. 
Um, and that's kind of the, the way that playgrounds are designed. And um, in a way, you want to separate those two age groups, but have some elements that we could bring some of the kids from the 2 to 5 and the 5 to 12 to actually kind of uh, have a little bit of interaction too. So we want to keep them separated, but we also want to have some areas that they can actually uh, um, uh, play with each other at some, at some other points. Um, and with, uh, so now going to the design, what we're looking here is an area uh, that is the 2 to 5, kind of farther away from the main sidewalk that goes out to the street. And then you have a 5 to 12 year old area to the right. The idea is that in phase one, um, being very realistic here with the budget that we have, we are going to be facing this project. Um, but to make it uh, the most functional we can with a phase one, the idea, my idea was to bring in a piece of equipment that's two to five year old, that's a multi-use piece of equipment or what we call uh, so a something in the, in the realm of, of something like this where you have a lot of play elements within one piece of equipment. Um, and the idea is that we will put, we will install or we're proposing to install one for the five to 12 year olds and one for the two to five year olds and leaving enough space for other elements that could come in later on um, in the next phases or the next phase. Um, so the elements that we have here right now, we will have those uh, multi-use play equipment. We would have a sidewalk that kind of uh, divides the two spaces and provides access to both of them um, and for uh, people of disabilities and also for um, creating almost a little loop that um, uh, children could come in with their um, push bikes or they're starting off to uh, learn how to ride a bike, they could actually just you know, go around um, at their playground and, and enjoy it that way. Um, in, the, in the Florence Fields face of the project that's already built, we actually had included several benches. So we don't have to include a bench right now because we have one, two, three, four benches right now looking into the playground as, as the design is. Um, and then the idea was that to bring in once, uh, after the phase one, that we have uh, enough space for including several elements and we would be looking at elements that would, could be, um, for instance, um, bouncing elements uh, for the two to five year olds or imaginative play like, uh, you know, a structure that kind of looks like a boat and that could become kind of a, a, play, a place where kids could use their imaginations and play. Um, also, um, this, well, it's called the triple shifter, but an element that um, is not as active and that um, kids could actually have um, kind of a moment to the side and they could talk to other kids while they're there. Um, so giving multiple uh, smaller elements around the bigger play equipment that we were, we were proposing for phase one. Um, and there are several examples of how that could be achieved. You know, it could be something that looks uh, modern, Modern, like what I showed now, or you know, it, it uses um, you know elements like steel that's raw that doesn't have a lot of you know bright colors on the actual tubes, and um, also we could go with something that's more traditional uh, looking, sort of uh, like uh, our typical play equipment, um, more plastic, more of that sort. Um, there are also elements that could be used like a small playhouse. Um, so I, there are very, you know, we have a lot of options of what we could do uh, with uh, the space. I think what we really want to pinpoint at this point is that big uh, piece of equipment, that big element. And in here I'm showing a two to five year old, which are kind of my favorite pieces that I, of the examples that I brought in. Uh, one of them, uh, both of these, one for the 2 to 5 and one for the 5 to 12, both of them would have very similar elements to tie the design together. Um, they look like um, tree houses, so I mean kind of an abstracted tree house, so it has panels even though they're made out of plastic, they look like wood um, and give you that feeling of, uh, of something that's appropriate for the site, which is a beautiful uh, kind of agricultural and kind of um, uh, agricultural site, even though we have a park there. But we don't. We didn't want to bring. I, I personally don't want to bring something that's very clashy that has a lot of 
you know, intense colors, um, and I brought some examples of other projects that are in other places, but things like these elements, personally, wasn't where I was leaning towards uh, for play elements because I thought they were just a little bit too bright for that for that space and a little bit out of context uh, with the kind of agricultural use that, that um, the fields across the street get and the openness of the of the park. Um, so, and within the um, five to twelve year olds. Um, elements, uh, I can see that we would, again, would have a multi-use play uh, ground system that would have many elements to it. It could look like these where, again, they look like your typical playground. Um, you do have more modern uh, looking elements that are more steel, have more um, um, exposed uh, steel and less of your common type of playground equipment. Um, these two at the top here are mostly uh, climbing elements that you would go through, almost like a, like an obstacle course type uh, playground. And then you have these element, these uh, playgrounds that are um, again have multiple uh, uses. They have slides, but they have a look that's a little bit more modern to them. Um, but at the same time, pretty simple looking that again would fit very well with the uh, with the context that we have in the park. And one, um, so some of the extra elements, meaning phase two, that I can see happening here would be maybe a net structure. Um, they don't have to be huge net structures, but some type of net structure could happen next to these other elements that we have there. And in this case, these are kind of nature inspired. One of them is, it looks like a, like a, um, a spider web. Um, this one is like a big frog that you can kind of climb on them. Um, so it gives a little bit more of a, of a custom built feel to them because they have these kind of themes to them. Uh, other elements that we could add around those uh, 5 to 12 year old main structure would be climbing elements. And in here they have some that kind of imitate trees um, and some of them imitate um, other vegetation so you can climb on these poles and, 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 and go all the way through. And again, for instance, if we went with the uh, treehouse kind of theme, these um, climbing elements work very well with them. They're, the colors are, are consistent and um, again, we're look I personally was looking at the browns, the tans, and the greens instead of the very bright colors because uh, I think it fits better with the, with the park. One other Thank element you. that I know Thank was um, talked about and people were interested in seeing was uh, rock adventure playground. So these are examples of different types of uh, rock adventure playground elements that we could use. Um, I, I, I want to make sure that people understand that these, these, even though they look like normal rocks, they're man-made, they have, um, they're structurally very sound, they don't break apart because they have uh, fiber, uh, fiberglass fibers going through the concrete, but on the other hand that makes them pretty expensive. So in this first phase, we wouldn't be able to install one of these, but I can see how in the future, um, on phase two, we could uh, have some of, um, some of these climbing rocks and kind of more natural looking rocks, which would work, for instance, these would work very well with that uh, first playground that I showed that looks like a, more like a, like a tree house. So you can see how you know, the rocks and the treehouse looking type uh, play structures would, you know, be very harmonious. They would work really well with each other. Um, and in here I'm showing two examples of the two trends that are in rock adventure playgrounds. One of them is having these larger boulders that have handholds the same way that you would go to a rock climbing gym uh, type of features. Then there are these almost like obstacle course types um, where it's not about the handhold and kind of a rock climbing element, it's more of a, more of an, a play adventure where they have ropes that you can grab onto and kind of move from one rock to the other, um, which encourages balance and, and help from all the other kids and that type of thing. But they're not um, as um, structured as a climbing wall that has a certain amount of handholds that, that are there uh, for the kids to climb on. Um, we've recently installed one of these uh, playgrounds up in Turner's Fall, so I'm, I'm inviting anybody uh, who's interested in making any comments to go up there and, and look at them and, 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 and 
see how they like them. Um, and let me see. Going back to the original design, I've talked about the play equipment, but a uh, major part of this whole uh, design is also uh, the safety surface that would have to go underneath and the drainage, and that's one of the, it's the infrastructure and it's, uh, it's expensive, but it's something that we have to do to have a safe playground and a playground that would last for a long time. So we need, uh, and in this case, we've proposed to use, again, the uh, fiber, the wood fiber, the wood chip type of, of surface because of uh, budget reasons. Um, we couldn't go with a rubber um, surface in here, even though it's, it lasts maybe longer, but it is very expensive up front uh, as an upfront cost. So this tends to be probably one fifth of the cost of the rubber surfacing, uh, which works with the budget that um, the Parks and Rec uh, have for the, for the park. Um, and I think now I'm open to any questions. And I think we're going to stop the. Yeah. If anyone has comments, the Rec Department website is going to have information over the next couple days with the different plans and pictures and. Comments can come to me at the recreation office, um, you know, for for the probably like the next week or so. Yep. Um, I'll take anything. So, thank you, Carlos. Thank you. Mm -hmm.